Ever wondered how vast hot deserts like the Sahara and the Australian outback came to be? Well, location is key. Most hot deserts are located along the tropics between 10 degrees and 40 degrees latitude in both the northern and southern hemispheres. But why is location important? Well, the intense sun near the equator heats the air, causing it to rise and gather moisture. As this warm, moist air moves away from the equator, it cools down and descends around 30 degrees latitude. This process releases moisture as rainfall in the tropics, and that now dry air warms up again as it descends, leading to arid conditions that are perfect for desert formation. Continental interiors might also develop hot deserts because regions deep within continents become dry because air currents lose most of their moisture after traveling long distances over land. You might also see hot deserts develop as a result of rain shadows. That's where mountain ranges block moist air from oceans, causing rain on the windward side and leaving the leeward side dry. But what makes a desert a desert? Extreme dryness. According to the Köppen Geiger climate classification, deserts receive less than 250 millimeters of annual precipitation. But the amount of annual precipitation isn't the only important thing. It's not just about how much rain falls. It's also how much water is lost. But why do we care? Why do we care about the precipitation level? Why do we care about the evaporation level? Why do we care about the aridity of a desert? Well, in desert ecosystems, water is everything. It's the one resource that shapes the entire environment. In world building, this means that if you're designing an arid world or a region with scarce water, you have to think about how the availability of water should dictate the survival strategies of its inhabitants from cultures to creatures. In deserts, rain is rare. It's random. It's brief. This creates a world of uncertainty. In your world, weather patterns like unpredictable storms or droughts could lead to cultures that are superstitious, opportunistic, or cautious. Societies might build complex systems to harvest every drop of water, while creatures could evolve to take advantage of these short windows of abundance. In real deserts, energy flow, like plant growth, is linked to water availability. When world building, imagine how water scarcity might limit agricultural growth, animal migrations, or even the rise and fall of empires. A land rich in sunlight but poor in water might develop alternative ways to store energy. Maybe your civilization relies on plant species that can survive extreme conditions or innovative technologies that trap water vapor from the air. Now, desert life doesn't just grow constantly. It waits for the right moment and it bursts into action when the rains come. For world building, this pulse reserve survival strategy can inspire cultures that operate in boom and bust cycles. Maybe you have settlements that spring to life after a rare rainstorm or nomadic tribes that plan their movements based on seasonal changes. In deserts, the soil is crucial because it stores and regulates water. For your world, this means you should think about how different types of soil or ground cover could affect agriculture, settlement locations, or even where magic or resources are strongest. When water is limited, plants, animals, and people all compete fiercely. In world building, this could create tension between desert kingdoms, factions, or species. The scarcity of water might lead to wars over oases or control of ancient water sources, fueling political and social conflict. It's a chance to build narratives around survival and alliances and betrayal in the harshest of environments. Even in deserts, conditions can vary wildly over short distances, so this creates a patchwork of ecosystems. In your world, you could use this concept to create regions within a desert that are surprisingly lush due to underground springs or rocky areas that are home to rare creatures. These mini-environments could offer strategic advantages or serve as story points or sacred sites for local cultures. Deserts don't produce a lot of life, but what they do create is extremely efficient. For world building, this can inspire economies or cultures built on making the most out of very little. A desert empire might not be wealthy in crops or livestock, but maybe its artisans create fine goods from scarce resources, or its warriors are famed for resilience and strategy because of the harsh environment that they've grown accustomed to. Now, living in a hot desert climate is not easy. These extreme conditions shape survival. Deserts have extreme challenges like intense sunlight, high temperatures, and scarce water, 
and the creatures and cultures of the desert have to evolve unique strategies to endure these harsh conditions. Now let's take a look at how desert agriculture developed. Well, in real history, in our world, ancient civilizations adapted to the harsh environment with innovative water and soil management systems. When you're building your world, you can show how your desert societies aren't just surviving, but they're thriving by creating technologies that align with the environment. Think about how they might adapt to extreme conditions and create sustainable ways to manage scarce resources. For example, in a desert, every drop of water counts. Ancient peoples maximized rain and flood water with runoff-based agriculture using structures like terraces and dams. When building your desert culture, you can focus on how they might develop similar similar techniques. Whether they're storing seasonal rain or harnessing rivers that flood once a year, these methods can drive your region's economy and shape the landscape. Desert agriculture often depended on stable political systems. When these systems collapsed, so did their agriculture. In your world, political upheaval or war might destroy irrigation canals or disrupt the management of vital resources and trigger famines and societal collapse. This could be a pivotal point in narrative, showing the fragility of even advanced societies when their infrastructure crumbles. You also need to think about the socioeconomic implications of so much of the power in deserts lying in the water. Because in many ancient societies, water control wasn't just about survival, it was about power. Whoever controlled the water controlled the land. In your world, consider how water and agriculture influence that landscape. Are there powerful water lords? Is access to water a privilege or is it a shared community? These tensions can create interesting dynamics in your desert civilizations. Let's turn next to trade. Trade in valuable resources like incense or spices often predates well-known historical records. Early civilizations may have relied on desert trade routes long before there was formal documentation of it, which laid the foundation for future wealth and power in key regions. Trade evolves over time. Desert trade in the real world didn't happen overnight. It developed slowly over millennia, starting as small exchanges and growing in complexity. Geography is key. The location of your deserts matter. In our world, the Negev acted as a land bridge between tropical regions in the Mediterranean, connecting distant civilizations. In your world, think about how deserts might serve as critical trade routes between regions that are otherwise difficult to connect. Technology drives trade. In the Negev, advancements like the use of pack animals and road construction increase trade efficiency. For your world, consider what technological leaps, like the invention of certain vehicles or infrastructure, could spark new trade networks or increase the scale of existing ones. Think also of where strategic trade hubs might lie. Certain cities or settlements located along trade routes can flourish unexpectedly, not because of any local resources, but because of their strategic location as intermediaries for desert and maritime trade. These hubs can act as critical points for the exchange of goods and ideas and cultures. Think about how monopolies and power might develop. So groups like The ancient Nabataeans controlled key trade routes, building wealth and power through their strategic position. In your world, control over a vital desert route could mean the rise of a powerful merchant guild or city-state or empire. Also think about the connection between the desert and sea routes. The most successful trade hubs are often those that connect overland desert routes with maritime ports, allowing goods to flow from distant inland sources to coastal cities and beyond. These points of intersection make ideal locations for rich and culturally diverse cities. The development of infrastructure was also important, including hidden cisterns and wells, and this was crucial for sustaining these caravans and expanding their carrying capacity and the routes across arid desert terrain. Caravan stops or trading hubs along these routes offered shelter and supplies to travelers and their animals. These places wouldn't just make trade easy between the cultures, they'd also act as social and economic hubs where they could exchange ideas, news, and goods. You also need to think about whether a state is sponsoring the trade. In the Nabataean era, the state invested in caravans, roads, and wells to support trade. Imagine how the kingdoms or empires in your world, either in the desert or outside of it, are pouring resources into infrastructure and securing their hold on vital trade routes. Now, trade systems reflect social structure. Early desert societies engaged in reciprocal trade, where the exchange of good also might have symbolized alliances. 
In your world, trade might not just be about goods. It could reflect deeper social bonds, peace treaties, or alliances between rival factions. And trade creates cultural exchanges. Goods traded across deserts weren't just materials. Of course, they're materials, but they carried culture. They carried ideas and innovations beyond and between civilizations. Think about how the trade routes in your world might facilitate the spread of knowledge, religion, or even magic between distant regions. The arid conditions of some deserts force traders to adapt to limited water and dangerous terrain. In your world, desert trade might involve navigating extreme conditions, forcing merchants to innovate with unique survival tactics or technologies. As desert societies shifted from hunting to herding, their involvement in trade grew. In your world, think about how these shifts in livelihoods, like nomadic herders or desert raiders, could influence trade and economic systems. The rise of the camel and the adoption of new technologies changed who controlled trade in the desert. Your world could have similar power shifts where technological or ecological changes lead to new groups rising as the dominant traders. In many desert regions, trade was seasonal based on what routes were passable at any time. Consider how your world's climate, seasons, or magical cycles affect trade, forcing traders to time their journeys carefully to avoid danger or maximize profits. You also need to think about the political influence of trade. Empires rise when they control key trade routes. In your world, who controls the desert routes? What political influence does that give them? How do others react to their monopoly? Another important aspect of some desert cultures that you frequently see is nomadism. Now, what are some important aspects of nomadism in desert cultures? Well, when designing desert nomads, consider alliances between tribes that unite for mutual survival or political gain. These alliances can create a powerful and mobile desert confederation, allowing tribes to exert influence over larger areas and defend against external threats. Consider how leadership is balanced by tribal authority. In a nomadic society, even a strong leader like a king or chief may not have absolute power. Tribal leaders or councils can influence decisions. Deserts particularly lead to more decentralization. Think about how the nomadic economies are based on their mobility. You can build desert nomad economies around that mobility with wealth coming from trade routes, from raiding, from pastoralism. Nomads can thrive by controlling key passages or resources, moving swiftly to trade or raid, depending on what the situation demands. Think about how cultural continuity is just in constant motion for nomad cultures. They, they might not have permanent cities, but their culture can persist through things like oral traditions, storytelling, and shared rituals. And these elements can give nomadic societies a strong identity that remains intact even as they move across vast deserts. Let's next explore how living in a hot desert climate might affect religious development and pantheons and mythology, cosmology, and rituals. The primary and most pressing concern for desert dwellers is often the harsh and unpredictable climate. Water scarcity, extreme temperatures, sandstorms, and the isolation of the desert foster a reverence for the natural elements. The pantheon in a world with significant desert or in a region of significant desert would likely elevate gods who represent these elemental forces. In some desert societies, gods of the sun, wind, and rain hold preeminent positions. Sun gods, you think the the sun is both a life giver and a destroyer in the desert. It provides the heat necessary for life, but can also lead to drought and death. Sun deities might be worshipped for their duality, representing both creation and destruction. These gods could be portrayed as capricious, demanding rituals to avoid their wrath or secure their blessings. In mythology, a sun god might be a central creator figure associated with birth, fire, and energy, but also seen as a harsh judge capable of burning away all life. You also could see people turn to wind gods. In the desert, the wind shapes the landscape. It erodes mountains and creates dunes. A wind god might be associated with communication, change, or transition, as winds in a desert often signal the movement of seasons or storms. Such a deity could be a trickster, unpredictable and volatile, sometimes bringing relief and sometimes disaster. Rituals to placate or call upon the wind might involve offerings of sound, songs, chants, or instruments that echo the whistling of the wind through the dunes. The scarcity of water in deserts might also elevate water deities to a position of supreme importance. These would represent life itself, with myths surrounding seasonal rains, underground rivers, or hidden springs. Now, they might be viewed, based on living in a desert, as elusive, appearing only to the most faithful and closely tied to growth. 
In desert cultures, water rituals could be among the most sacred, with rites performed to invoke the coming of the rain or to protect hidden water resources from being dried up by malevolent forces. You also could see desert mythology likely to revolve around themes of adversity and adaptation. The harshness of the environment might be reflected in stories where gods test mortals, forcing them to prove their worth through trials of endurance. You might also see isolation in the desert leading to mysticism, as the vast open space encourages reflection on the cosmos and the individual's place within it. Desert religions might be characterized by a deep sense of mystery, with gods who are distant, unknowable, and beyond human understanding. So gods in the desert may not be seen as approachable or as intimately involved in human affairs, but as these distant cosmic forces. If you've watched it this far, I want to invite you to do two things. First, check out the procedural map generator. It is open sourced, available online at ck2rpg.github.io slash generator. And please feel free to like and subscribe below if you'd like to follow along with the development of the generator or oh, my thoughts on world building. Thanks a lot for watching.